Fascism, The Complete Ideology Part 1. Since human beings have been on earth, one of the longest pondered questions largely remains answered, or, at least, doesn't receive anywhere near as much attention as it should in academia, in mainstream discourse, in our everyday lives in our societies. It's a question that has absolutely been asked by animal species as well, including apes and monkeys. It relates to everything, and is so metaphysical and fundamental, its implications could structure and influence the way in which we interact with the world, how we approach everyday situations, and, even, a guide for our ideological development, our political beliefs. This question is, the simple thought that it is, do groups exist? Beginning to debate whether or not groups can be said to exist is rather pointless unless one knows why someone is asking the question, and what their issue with the concept of groups even is to begin with. When they say groups, what, precisely, are they referring to, and what caused them to question whether they exist or otherwise? Well, to put things into easy to understand words, which is the purpose of this explanation, to explain fascism with linguistical terms anyone can understand. A group refers to the existence of a thing as one thing, despite being made up of multiple, seemingly or not, separate things. So, for instance, when we look at a book, we see a number of separate pages all attached to the same distinguishable property. The purpose of a book, in reference to its physical, printed form, is to collect all such pages as one object, or what, at least, appears as one object. We don't ever think of a book as a collection of pages, but rather just itself, in itself, as one object, as though the contents contained within it are, somehow, immutable, that the pages can't be torn off. But, of course, the pages can be torn off, with a book not even being a natural occurrence, not something born from nature and biology, but, rather, something socially constructed by human beings, all in an attempt to entertain themselves or educate themselves. The book didn't begin as the book, it began as a variety of separate, not whatsoever attached properties that were later combined into what society refers to, as visualizes as, one singular property. This reality, the fact that a thing is actually made up of more than one thing, that virtually nothing is a thing in itself, can be applied to all physical objects and subjects in life. We think of ourselves, as human beings, as individuals, as one thing. For instance, I am a person, thus, in my description of myself, a singular thing, that which is independent from other things, but, still, regardless, one thing, not two, or three, or trillions of things. But, in actuality, I actually are trillions of things. Consider the fact that I can chop off my hand, that any human being is capable of doing this. Is someone's chopped off hand still part of them, even when the hand is on the floor, or is it a separate thing? If it's a separate thing, meaning that the hand is no longer part of that person, at what points is it no longer part? When a hand is partially chopped off, or when it's fully chopped off? Or, alternatively, is it the case that the hand was never actually part of the person, but, instead, something of its own? The truth is actually really complicated, and there are multiple philosophical views competing to provide the clearest, most sensible explanation of this whole phenomenon. We speak of a thing as though it's only one thing, when, materially, it is trillions of separate things that have formed to provide the illusion of a singular thing. A hand is not one thing, even if it's not part of a human being. A hand is made up of water, blood, nails, skin meat, and bones. If one were to remove a bone from the hand, would that bone be one thing, or would it still be part of the hand? How could it be part of the hand when it's been extracted from the very thing it was, physically, formerly part of? Is a bone one thing, or is it multiple things, seeing it can be crushed with a hammer into a pile of dust, and the dust can be viewed as hundreds to thousands of separate things? A bone could be cut in half. Is the bone now one or two things? If it was one thing formerly, it makes no sense to classify it as two things now, since it's materially the same, only separated into a couple of classes. Biologically, the bone hasn't changed, only made more visibly independent. There is a philosophy, an ontological standpoint, 
known as materialism, which is the belief that things exist solely because they are material, that there is a scientific component, or set of components, which govern the world, and that is the explanation for all existence. So, materialism would hold that a bone within a human being's body exists not because of visual reasons, such as the ability to see the bone, or to sense that it exists, or of any belief which exists of the bone. Rather, it holds that the bone exists because of matter, referencing tiny, invisible to the human eye particles which float around within its confines. Everything in existence is composed of matter, including us. Human beings are made up of trillions of particles, both of the atomic variety and also subatomic, smaller than atoms. An atom can be viewed as one thing, and was initially by scientists, philosophers, and all types of skeptics, and, by skeptics, I mean actual skeptics, not neckbeard, cum-stained misogynist fuckboys, that was until smaller particles, pieces of matter, were discovered to be located within atoms, making atoms other than the smallest properties in the universe, or, dare I say, multiverse. When scientists looked into atoms, they found smaller and smaller particles, each particle formed by the flow of multiple smaller particles merging together to form what appears to be one singular subatomic particle. The smallest particle that human beings know of thus far, and what might be the smallest physical thing in all of existence, that which has ever existed, is called a quark. Quarks are the smallest properties we know of, and are what form all other particles, in a sense. You see, when two quarks flow together, merge, combine themselves, they form a hadron, which is the second smallest particle in existence, and, therefore, the second smallest thing of all. Now, the philosophical question of do groups exist arrives into play here. Are the two quarks one thing now, a hadron? since it always takes two quarks to create such a particle, or, alternatively, is the hadron its own thing, a thing in itself, just by itself, and not more than one physical property. It really depends on what view you yourself hold, whether you believe materialism to be ontologically correct or not. If materialism is, in fact, as a fact, correct, that it is the best means of viewing the universe, that it provides the most rational explanation for why anything exists at all, and has ever existed, then it would reason that the hadron is not one thing, but, in fact, no hadron exists, nor have any hadrons ever existed. The two quarks are just what they are, two quarks. There is not one thing, but two things which have been disgusted, due to their formation with one another, their scientific transformation, as two separate things. But, in actuality, no such things exist, as there is only a thing, knows. When one places an S at the end of a word, they use it to imply the existence of more than one thing, that the tree has turned into trees, or has, have always been trees, that the lake is not a lake, but rather an arrangement and collection of lakes, that the sun has, in fact, not set, but multiple suns have dimmed below the horizon, outside of the scientifically structured eye, or, dare it be put, eyes. Materially, there is no evidence for the existence of hadrons, just as there is no evidence for the existence of atoms. Atoms can't exist since they're just comprised of smaller particles, the smaller particles being the actually existent particles, and all larger particles just existing as a massive quantity of the smaller ones. So, all that can be said to exist in life, throughout all of the universe and all of time, is that of quarks. If one is logically consistent, and applies this manner of thought to everything which exists, and not merely to particles, it's the case that no thing outside of quarks exist, but that there is this lie known as consciousness which provides the illusion of other things existing. Flowers don't exist, they're just combinations of various other things. Their petals able to be removed to exist as separate objects from the rest of the flower, their stems able to be chopped and sliced, their pollen extracted by bees, and so on, the list is endless. Food doesn't exist, it's not one thing. Living creatures don't exist either, nor does the sky, nor does the moon, nor does anything which is visual, or even some non-visual things, such as larger particles, even other subatomic particles since all that exists are quarks. Due to quarks being too small to see, 
that even with the most amazing of magnifying glasses they're invisible, invisible not just to humans, but to every conscious creature that has ever lived, it can only be argued that they exist due to material subsistence, and not, in contrast, to conscious ability detecting and generating them. Since they're outside, external to, the realm of consciousness, that there is no alertness to what they look like, how they move, how they spin, they can't exist within any ontology which claims that existence is constructed and maintained by the mind. Outside of the mind, of any conscious force, quarks float and flow as properties in themselves, not created by anything, not containing anything, but containing only themselves, and having created all other things in existence. In the materialist view of history, quarks have always existed, weren't formed by anything, and are the ultimate source of power, that they are indestructible. What holds up the existence of all other physical creations? Back in the old days, when the world still hadn't discovered anything within atoms, particles smaller than them, there was a certain philosopher, a unique ontologist, who was outspoken about some conclusions of atomist theory. This philosopher, in case you haven't already guessed, is obviously Democritus. Democritus was one of the many people in the pre-Christian era of the planet who studied the movements and tendencies of atoms, and how they were found within every visual property a person can be conscious of. Democritus wrote extensively about the nature of atoms, mostly in the standard scientific manner that would far later into history arrive to be the norm, in terms of the type of conversations that surrounded atoms, not really philosophical or ideological, but just normative, factual sentiments. Democritus decided to intellectualize things past the point that most scientists, and, in fact, most philosophers even, had during his time, and have today. Democritus believed what has already been described by me, that everything is just atoms, that nothing else exists, that everything we see, that can enter into the sphere of consciousness, is just a very fleshed out projection of invisible properties swimmering beneath the surface. Democritus saw what we saw, what he saw, as nothing more than meaningless creations of a far more superior, supreme set of objects, the atoms that built the civilizations which lay before us. If it weren't for atoms, none of the things that have converted themselves into visuality would subsist. But, he also came to another conclusion, one that was logically consistent with the previously elaborated upon one. He believed that people believed in too many abstractions, that, as a reality, it was unfortunate and unnecessary that individuals held onto and worshipped non-existent manifestations of their imagination. Think of all the immaterial things which exist in our world, in the various cultures that have crafted their own norms, standards, and rules. Think of religions, think of the idea of gods, think of the various myths that have been spread, the supposed existence of ghosts, of the supernatural, the non-natural, the anti-naturalist point of view, that specific perspective, which causes such phenomena to exist in the first place. Ponder morality, ponder definitionless concepts such as romantic love and sexuality, think of how ingrained they are into so many cultures, the sheer quantity of people adhering to ideas they perceive to be real that are devoid of any scientific, physical basis. Democritus was a materialist, an historically important one, who had realized that a thing is the thing that it is, but not in the consciousness-oriented sense. A fence isn't a fence because it can be broken apart into smaller objects, smaller, thinner pieces, as opposed to atoms, which are still, static, without alteration. Of course, as already mentioned, atoms aren't the smallest particles in the world. So, I suppose atomism has now been converted into quarkism? But, yes, everything is quarks, and all products of human worship which involve the immaterial, the spiritual, the scientifically unverifiable, all propped up by anti-naturalist thinking, should all be erased, no longer supported. Crystals don't have healing powers, no matter how much one perceives them to, no matter how much consciousness attempts to rewrite the natural laws of the physical realm. Ghosts don't exist, and the afterlife can only exist on some material basis, not a religious one. Karma is a myth, and so are all the deities, and the myths told by the world's various religions. One who subscribes to materialist ontology can see the sheer level of hurt, cruelty, and violence theocracy and religious fundamentalism has brought down upon the earth, 
that all the fabrications about having to follow in God's footsteps hasn't actually saved anyone from hell, as such a vision of hell is also a lie, but, has, instead, just eroded the liberties and natural rights of the governed populace. As Democritus once said, nothing exists except atoms and space, everything else is opinion. All the opinions people produce, all the actions they take, none of which things are real. It doesn't matter what something looks like, because materially there is no proof of its existence, its character, and, in actuality, only scientific elements of this universe can be said to be the truth. The question of do groups exist has been answered by one shade of ontology, materialism. The truth, its truth, at least, is that groups do not exist, as science testifies against them. Two quarks, even when they're not combined into a hydron, exist as themselves, but aren't a group. They're not physically attached to one another, in any way related, possess a tied relationship. If one quark were to disappear, which is impossible, as quarks are indestructible and eternal, but just hypothetically, the other quark would still remain, completely and utterly unaffected, not having noticed the other particle having vanished. It is unaffected because it's not part of any group, nor can it be said that any scientific content exists in groups. When two quarks merge together, seemingly forming a hadron, they're still not a group, as their transition into a hadron is an illusion, that consciousness doesn't, to any degree, correlate with truth, that truth is independent from the mind. Now, the materialist view of life has been expressed, explained, put forth. But, what if there were to be an alternate theory, a different, contrasting explanation, which could give us different implications for how the world should work? What if, just what if, the spiritual was more important than the physical, that consciousness instead played the most crucial role in shaping the land escapes which surround us? Well, there is this philosophy known as idealism, which is the polar opposite to materialism. While materialism holds that matter creates and sustains all the activity and visuality which occurs in this realm, idealism holds the reverse, that the mind, that perception, is the most important element, that it constructs and floats the mountains and the forests. Idealism, like materialism, is an ancient philosophy that dates back to the first means of communication that the human species developed. Everything from the earliest writings, to cave paintings, to contemporary comments on oral verbalization that commence between members of sub-Saharan tribes, all indicate that human beings have always debated over what causes anything to exist, what sprung us to the point of consciousness, and what continually keeps us here, awakened. Idealism doesn't believe that matter plays any part in holding together the fabric of reality, that matter is only a byproduct of consciousness, and that consciousness predates it. Consciousness, in idealism, was the first thing of all things, having always existed, and something which will always exist. It cannot be destroyed, nor can it be compromised. The reason that a house exists is that it's seen, it's perceived to exist, to exist as what it appears as, that it's the production of collective consciousness, all the minds and visions of a population combine, which details and textures the design of all properties. When asked the question of do groups exist, idealism's reply is not only merely that groups exist, but that only groups exist. See, the distinction between individual and collective, between one and multiple, between a singular thing and heaps of things, has always been a false narrative, which is something both ontological worldviews can safely assert. Materialism doesn't believe that any group can exist, that only individuals are present, and all attempts to claim that both can exist simultaneously go against the scientific formula. Idealism, somewhat similarly, asserts that no individuals can exist, that they, indeed, do not exist, and only groups have forever been present. The problem both ontologies have with the mainstream view, that is not arrived at, but rather merely the default point of view, which requires no thought, is produced of no reasoning, that individuals and groups both exist, is that it either contradicts the scientific method or the spiritual method. Since the dawn of human communication, there has been this raging conflict, this ideological war, waged between the forces of the scientific sphere and the spiritual dimension, between the corporeal and the perceptual, between matter and mind. It can't be both, it just has to be either. 
if perception determines the existence of something, or, even, the non-existence of a certain thing, it would reason that matter doesn't exist, since it can't be perceived, since it's invisible. And, additionally, the only things which are real, that are the truth, are those which can enter into the tunnel of consciousness, that something is existent as long as the collective are conscious of its presence. When something fades from consciousness, it no longer exists. When something has drifted into the frame of consciousness, that thing is true. This applies to everything, to whether something is moral or not, to whether a policy should be implemented, to parenting, to laboring, to learning, to education, to the ethics behind wars. The truth, what should and what shouldn't be, are all determined collectively, that is, through consciousness. A glass of water is what it is not because of the particles found within, which, in idealism, aren't found within, but because there is a sense of the glass, that the water is the because one thinks it to be there. Nothing less, nothing more. So, only things one can be conscious of exist, and all things outside of consciousness, external to its range, its sight, are non-existent. As this is the case, there's no means for individuals to be able to exist, as all individuals are, in fact, just collectives, existent only because of the collective that sees, hears, and senses. When we examine a rock, for instance, we could see an individual, but just as with materialism, the rock is actually comprised of other objects. Here, however, unlike in materialism, idealism holds that the conscious observers determine the nature, character, and quality of the rock, that it is collectively designed by all who are aware of its presence. Because of this, not just rocks, but everything in existence, is the product of collective consciousness that our minds combined have structured our surroundings, and, by extension, ourselves, to be what they are. There is no necessary distinction between subject and object, between observer and observed, since the observers create the observed, but, they themselves had to be observed in the first place, with the most common explanation as to how any of this can be pointing to a theistic answer, God having created all observing subjects, having always existed themselves just a synonym for consciousness and everything that's spawned from it. Think of it this way. When one dreams, when they're unconscious in the normative sense, but still conscious of something within the dreamscape, their imagination, it's reasonably understood that everything which has manifested in such dreams is merely a reflection of the individual. When a person falls asleep and finds themselves in a landscape created by their mind, it makes no sense to say that the bookshelves, the creatures, the palaces, the cities, the jungles, and so on, are external to them. They are not external to the one experiencing the dream. They are the individual dreaming. They're just as much oneself as one's body is oneself, and a lot of the time one's body doesn't even manifest in a dream. The pillows, the blankets, the night sky, the darkness, the gas station, the murder, the money, the sadness, the happiness, the roads, the trucks, the countries, the governments, the kings and the queens, the police, the night, the silverware, the water, the milk, the clothes, the volcano, the graves, the skeletons, the people, the voices, they're all you. Normally, when one speaks of experiencing the dream state, they're speaking of a realm controlled only by them, even if they uncontroversially admit that the dreams are production of their imagination, with all of its subjects and objects themselves as well. However, in idealism, where all of waking reality is just one big dream, it's the case that not a single individual is responsible for all of the occurrences, the movements, the activities, which go on, but rather the entire collective. Just as there is no individual or individuals in a dream, due to everything witnessed, observed and perceived, constructed out of consciousness, being of the same soul, the same essence, not separate, not independent, there is no individual or individuals in the awakened world, just as much a spirit realm as the dreamscape. Just as there's no true difference between subject and object, the same can be stated about the dream world and the real world. Both are equally real, equally valid, and composed of the same fundamental essence that composes everything, causing everything to exist, consciousness. As opposed to viewing one person as responsible for a dream, idealism views the collective 
every person, every object, all of consciousness interwoven, as creating and shaping the landscapes present, at triggering the events of world history, crafting all the moments of everyone's life. There is nothing solo about this world than, but, instead, something communitarian and collectivistic about the inherent nature of the galaxy. Quite notably, there was a British idealist philosopher by the name of Francis Herbert Bradley, an adherent to the metaphysical beliefs of Friedrich Hegel, the founder of fascism, who commented extensively on the needless dichotomy placed upon individual and collective by a not-so-philosophical society. F. H. Bradley was a devoted idealist, who wrote on the subject of metaphysical idealism at length, detailing his criticism of materialism and all individualistic doctrines. Being a British nationalist, he was often irritated by the type of dialogue that commenced between people of British citizenship, when they spoke of the issues that came with prioritizing a collective identity over that of individual recognition. Unlike such people, Bradley didn't view people as distinct from their country, or from their government, but actually as one, all combined, integral, in totality, requiring one another to reinforce each other. Bradley specifically responded to the claim that if one person within a lined up circle of people were to step out of the ring, the whole thing would collapse, or, rather, that the collective would lose a component, that it testifies to the invalid nature of groups, that the very concept of groups was archaic and at odds with progressive values. Bradley wrote that the issue with this mindset is that it views the individual in question as someone who's acted off color to the rest of the group, as opposed to this very action being the production of the consciousness of the group itself. While the group didn't make quite the wisest decision, Bradley acknowledges, the idea of British nationality still holds strong, due to the spiritual elements which bind together all spheres of existence. While there are those who use their minds to argue against the truth of one being able to use their mind to create change, it, nonetheless, subsists as the truth that one cannot break away from such a reality, that using the mind to fight against the will of the mind goes strictly against the ontology permitting anything and everything. If individuals truly existed, the concept of nationalism would fail to take into account the individual differences between persons, which would better be accompanied through individual development, improvement, and growth, instead of something as collectivist as upholding and celebrating a country's identity and stability. But, this is forgetting the pre-established reality that the minds of all, no matter how different they are, are still interwoven, part of the same giant, scratching organism which lies at the heart the center, of all sparks and grackles. One can refuse to entertain the idea that the nation is the construct of their imagination, as with everyone's imagination, but this would be foolish, as one's nation is best representative of them, in the identical way to how a dream is, and their unique wants and needs. Hence, why tearing down borders would leave the planet in a chaotic, miserable, and lost state, due to not being closest to the destiny consciousness has driven people to. It's not the case, nor has ever been the case, that individual people within a society can be separated from that society, as each person is absolutely integral to the development and nourishment of each other, to the point where entire guild systems have been established to prop up this phenomenon, not only the nation and the state, but the church, the family, and every institution established by the state, from schools to workplaces, to libraries to shopping centers. It would be nonsensical to exclude any of such things from oneself, as they're just as much an expression of the individual's consciousness as they are derived from the consciousness of everyone else. The conviction one holds, where a person believes in the existence of such things without the slightest doubt in their mind, is what permits for their existence to be continued, since the reality of everything is dependent upon how it's perceived, structuring and painting everything to be as it is, without exception or contradiction.